Great. Well, I think we'll get started. Uh, welcome, everyone, and um, happy almost summer. And we have the um, June gloom to prove it. Although anytime I'm wearing my, my white linen jacket, it must be summer. Um, I'm Gabriel Meyer, the executive director of the Ruskin Art Club of Los Angeles, now in its 134th year. This is our um, final event of the spring 2022 season. And we're delighted that all of you could join us tonight for a very important, if um, somewhat provocative topic, uh, John Ruskin in uh, popular media. Without further ado, I'm going to turn this over with great pleasure to uh, our Ruskin uh, board member and colleague, uh, Sarah Atwood. In addition to serving on our board of directors, Sarah is co-director with Jim Spates of the Ruskin Society of North America and a companion of the Guild of St. George, Ruskin's charity founded in 1871. Sarah has lectured widely on Ruskin, both in the US and abroad, focusing particularly on education, the environment and, the, and language. Regulars at these lectures will remember Sarah's penetrating talk on Ruskin and Emerson last May, available on our YouTube channel. She has also written on the topic we're considering, where she's also written on uh, Ruskin in France, Ruskin and Proust, um, including an essay published in the review 19th Century Prose in 2017. When she's not lecturing about Ruskin, she's a lecturer in English literature and writing at Portland Community College. Sarah. Thank you, Gabriel. Uh, welcome everyone. I'm glad to see everyone here tonight. And I'm really delighted to be doing this because I'm a great fan of, of Anne. Um, Anne and I have collaborated together. I think it was, I'm gonna get the year wrong, 2016, Anne or 18, um, on a Ruskin conference in Toronto. Uh, we worked with the William Moore Society of Toronto and the Guild of St. George, um, and it was a very successful event. I had a great time doing it. Uh, so I'm really delighted to be um, hosting here tonight and to hear Anne's talk. Um, Anne is an educational developer at the University of Toronto Mississauga and an adjunct communications instructor at George Brown College. Her work and research focuses on supporting accessible pedagogy, especially through reference to the sensory. And her book, Employing the Tactile, Embodying the Tactile in Victorian Literature, Touching Bodies, Bodies Touching, was published just last year by Lexington Press. I have a copy here. It's gonna look backwards on my screen, but here it is. Other Ruskin um, focused publications include Architecture and Perception, The Science of Art in Ruskin, in Victorians, a Journal of Culture and Literature. She's also spoken on Ruskin and Tactility at international conferences and at Birkbeck University of London. She's a companion of the Guild of St. George, a board member of the Ruskin Society of North America. She is a pleasure to work with, and I know that this talk will be fascinating. So I'll turn it over to Anne now. Those, those are all too kind words. Thank you so much. All true, yes. all true. Also, so uh, let, me, let me share my screen right now. All right, fantastic. And please do let me know. Um, I have the chat open as well. So please do let me know if you cannot see. Um, the slides or, or anything uh, like that. Are we okay with the slides? Thumbs up, okay, fantastic. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Um, I'd like to start um, as I uh, regularly do. I have given the slide deck in the chat, um, so you'll have that as a copy. Um, I'd also like to start with a land acknowledgement. I'd like to acknowledge that I'm currently located on the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. Um, and I also want to acknowledge that I was born and raised on the traditional land of the Abitsibiwini Aki Cree. And I am very grateful to those lands, both past and present, that have allowed me to be who I am and to be with you here this evening. Um, I also just want to do a quick access check. So as I said, um, I've, given, um, I've given you the slides ahead of time. Uh, if my pace is too quick, please just in the chat, let me know, um, tell me to slow down. I have a tendency to speak quickly when I'm excited about something as most people do. Um, and if there's any other things that um, you would like, um, please let me know. I do have a one page resource uh, that I will give at the end. 
of the talk. So um, I know this looks like a lot. I promise. Um, I promise I will try to keep to time. Um, I will talk with the uh, start with a little bit of context, and uh, of course I'm going to bring in accessibility and education here because those are things that are very important to me, and I promise that it connects to what I'm talking about this evening. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about touch. Um, and this will be the focus for this evening in terms of uh, representations of Ruskin in the media and how they all seem to be about touch. And hopefully that'll open up the conversation for us to have a conversation about that um, and uh, how Ruskin touches, how Ruskin is touched, um, and uh, to speak a little bit to some representations both in images and on the screen, um, and also the more modern uh, reception. And as we were speaking at the beginning, uh, there was some discussion before we started. There was some discussion about whether or not the reception of Ruskin has changed, and in some ways it has, but in other ways, in spaces uh, not our uh, in spaces not like these spaces, I feel like the conversation's a little stagnated, and so therefore let's let's have a conversation about how to make Ruskin a little bit more accessible. So I'm going to leave that outline um, up, uh, and I'll switch when I get to the midpoint here. So I guess um, I need to start at the beginning. Because if I don't give you any context, you probably will have a tougher time with why this specific topic matters to me. And I'm sure that Ruskin was, would agree that context is important. And I'm sure that many, that maybe there are one of you here this evening that could actually tell me, I'm pointing at you, Jim, uh, how many times the word context is used um, in the complete works of Ruskin. Um, I can guess it's probably not a lot because according to Google Ngram, the word context reached its apogee in uh, 2004, long after Ruskin time, but I digress. Uh, context is important to my talk this evening because one of the things that I will argue is that many of the media depictions of Ruskin lack context. Um, and I would argue that they lack context on purpose uh, to paint a very different picture of Ruskin. I keep thinking to myself every time I see a Ruskin depiction in a TV series, in a movie, in a passing article that's not written by an academic, and maybe sometimes when it is, in a drawing, that they all seem to be getting Ruskin horribly wrong. But I also need to acknowledge that maybe it's me who's getting Ruskin wrong, because of course my scope is not the scope of others who would deem themselves Ruskinians. Um, I came to Ruskin in grad school through a mandatory class in my master's year that was focused on bibliography. And uh, the professor, when there was so much available to talk about in terms of Ruskin and his work and curation, for example, the professor instead, of course, sadly, decided to focus on Effie and Ruskin and well, the story. <laughs> and so the story, the only story that everyone seems to know about Ruskin, the story that Jim and many others have addressed many times, um, and it's the story that that kind of led me to Ruskin, because I knew that I wanted to go into doctoral studies, and I knew that I wanted to focus on the sensory. And so it was clear that Ruskin was someone that I needed to know, even if the story seemed very problematic. So however, uh, in my studies, I came across the ethics of the dust. And the ethics of the dust was something that really captured my interest because there was so much going on in that text. And Sarah has written about this as well in her book. Um, around the sensory, and in particular, my area of interest, which was touch or representations of tactility, I pretty much fixed on that text and on other aspects of the elements of drawing, for example, uh, for my dissertation and my articles and conference papers because of that tactile focus. It was obvious that Ruskin was someone who was so very focused on the visual, on seeing, of course, because, quote, to see clearly is poetry, prophecy, and religion all in one, end quote. And yet for me, there was something else. That something else was the tactile and it needed to be explored further. And so what I was seeing in the ethics of the dust, there was just as much touch there that needed to be accounted for in Ruskin than all the focus on the visual. And of course, this takes us back to the story, doesn't it? And the lack of touch and how the story plays out in so many representations we see in, in Ruskin in the media. And I know that we're gonna be talking about three of them this evening. And some of you have mentioned to me that you haven't seen any of them um, exactly because they focus on the story. Um, and so uh, hopefully this will be a, a space to kind of open that up and have a conversation. Um, I will argue in our time together here this evening that it is a focus on touch and lack thereof that in most ways um, allows Ruskin to become a caricature. The specter of, of touch becomes 
and is is present and is seen in most of these depictions of Ruskin as a historical figure, but a critical engagement with why that tactility is there seems to be lacking. There's no context. Say the importance of hands to craft work or the educational possibilities of touch, none of that is there. Looking at the various aspects of tactile aesthetics in Ruskin's art highlights his active engagement with his surroundings on learning through touch, instances that the media depictions almost willingly ignore for the sake of keeping up that story. So I'm gonna digress a little bit more here to give you a little bit more context. And I hope you won't mind because most of you actually, I've never met most of you. So now you get to know a little bit more about me. Um, <laughs> Um, I'm going to try and model, I guess, the kind of discourse that Ruskin himself valued. I'm returning to Ruskin tonight, not because I study him much anymore. In fact, the last time I returned to Ruskin was when I was finishing up that monograph that uh, Sarah was speaking to that was published uh, last January in 2021. Ruskin isn't much part of my world anymore because my focus now is on pedagogy and pedagogical praxis. And if I had to highlight thinkers whose work I probably engage with more, it would be Henri Bergson and his concept of durée and Virginia Woolf's uh, Bloomsbury psychogeography. Time and space and how that intersects with the sensory, these are where my random thoughts end up when I'm in the hammock in the backyard on Saturdays thinking my big thoughts. Um, and I acknowledge that that's also a very big privilege to have. But none of these three amazing thinkers and writers, Bergson, Wolf, Ruskin, are really part of my day to day anymore and haven't for the last decade because I tired of the adjunct life after realizing that choosing to be a Victorianist was probably not the wisest area to focus on in terms of finding full time teaching. And so instead, um, I chose to focus on something that allows me to put my sensory scholar interest and my passion for ethical pedagogy into practice. And that is supporting accessible pedagogy at colleges and universities, and which is what I do for a living now. So I work as an educational developer, and that means that I help faculty and instructors and grad students and postdoctoral fellows look at their pedagogy and see how they can make their classes more inclusive and accessible by adding multimodal elements, by designing different aspects of their courses, and being very meaningful about the assignments and the activities that they choose to do in the course to attain the outcomes. In fact, I kind of spend my day dealing with pedagogical retrofits. Uh, which speaks a lot to Ruskin and to Morris and their thought about architecture in a way. I have, of course, a shirt that says, when we build, let us think that we build forever. And I feel that higher education could learn a lot <laughs> reflecting on that. Um, there's a lot to be said in higher education about this is how we've always done this and what happens in curriculum and pedagogy is very much stuck in some ways to John Houseman with his elbow patched tweed uh, in the paper chase, which is a fantastic movie and no offense to elbow patched tweed. I have some myself, um, but there are some reasons why uh, a lot of instructors decide that this is the way that they're going to teach. And so I'd like to make things more accessible. There's a lot of echoes to Ruskin in the work that I do here. Uh, critical disability scholar Mia Mingus tells us that folk in the disability community need to leave their evidence of their lives lived. And I cannot help but think that Ruskin could appreciate that guidance as a way to record life and the experiences accurately. As he says in The Stones of Venice, never encourage imitation or copying of any kind except for the sake of preserving records of great works. So Ruskin is very much about preservation, about recording. And in my work, I try to remember and remind instructors that they also need to be mindful of that sensory and all of those points that go into the curriculum and the pedagogy. This particular topic is important to me because I'm invested in making Ruskin accessible to a larger audience, accessible to the people that would not have the opportunity to encounter him, maybe sadly only through the story when they do. And here I'm thinking of the great work of Ruth Nutter, who has done community outreach programs and building community around that. And if you haven't read, um, if you haven't read Paradise is Here, it's, it's fantastic. I strongly suggest it. Um, but I think there's a very real opportunity to bring Ruskin's work to others and to undo the story and, the, and focus more on his thought. And it's important for me to also note here that I'm a scholar based in Canada. And I have very limited access to resources and information that you have in the States. For example, I've never been able to see or even read a copy of John Ruskin, A Life in Pictures. 
which is a sad travesty, a book that would be particularly foundational and crucial to what I'm discussing here this evening, because all of the literary and library holdings for this book are in the States, and the only copy is in UBC, uh, in Canada is at UBC, which is the complete opposite end of the country to me. So ultimately, the secondary purpose of this talk is to raise awareness of the inequities of access of information to folk who ha don't have the financial means to go to trips to Europe or the US every year. And this is a very real experience for many scholars and particularly graduate students and adjuncts and early career researchers and independent scholars. And it's important to keep in mind if we wanna make Ruskin accessible to the public. We need virtual discussion spaces such as this uh, to be able to increase the awareness and the outreach. So, you know, for folk that cannot summer in the archives, for example. And this is all part of a need for a movement towards a more ethical depiction of Ruskin. So the more access, the more ethical the depiction of Ruskin. So I promise that's the end of the context. You should be able to follow all of the twists and turns I'm going to go through tonight uh, in terms of the artifacts and so on. Um, I invite you to think along with how the connection to the sensory in particular touch and how touch is depicted um, and in some ways purposefully withheld in these representations and what that says about learning or the hostility to learn. And it's my hope that we may come up with things that we haven't considered before. So touching is learning. I would argue that the ethics of dust focuses on how touch is necessary to learn. And as someone who's invested in supporting faculty to reflect on that pedagogy and, and to make it accessible uh, and how sensory is part of our learning spaces and how sometimes not acknowledging that sensory creates a barrier for learners, this text in all its ways is a perfect example of experiential learning. It is a touch, it's a learning by touch book. As we see in the Stones of Venice, Ruskin is a firm believer in how creating allows memories to be secured. And Alain de Botton describes Ruskin's relation to the sensory and art as the process of recreating with our own hands what lies before our eyes. We may seem naturally to evolve from observing beauty in a loose way to one where we acquire a deep understanding of its constituent parts and hence more secure memories of it. Yet in the media depictions, there is a fear of that deep understanding. There's a fear of getting too close that Ruskin can't touch or he doesn't want to touch or there's a fear of knowing too much. And well, I think all of us in this room can agree that this is not the Ruskin we know. Or the opposite that happens where Ruskin is mocked for showing too much knowledge and is socially out of touch a sort of anti-intellectualist framing that I'm sure folk in the United States and in Canada witness every day on the news and in social media. So the original inspiration for this paper was the uh, John Ruskin Artist and Observer exhibit that ran in the National Gallery of Canada in Ottawa in February to May in 2014, which was, wow, like eight years ago. And I was very lucky that it did stop in Canada and relatively close to me. I took a quick day trip there um, between all my teaching commitments at the time. And for those of you who know Canada, you will realize that Toronto and Ottawa are not necessarily day trip distance, but when Ruskin calls, you must listen. And so therefore I got on a train and I went. Um, and the main focus of the exhibit was that despite being primarily known or referred to as a critic, it was important to explore Ruskin as an artist in his own right. And the best way to achieve this was by highlighting the observational mode or seeing in Ruskin. However, what the exhibit also demonstrated is that there's something more to seeing in Ruskin's focus and observation. And as Scheele states in Seeing and Feeling, it was first and foremost by means of I that Ruskin studied in the world around him. And there's a good reason to say that it was the act of drawing that most perhaps all of his ideas came truly tangible to him. And so, of course, I agree that the tangible thought is there in his drawing and the awareness of forms of rock and trees of buildings, but punch, and I'll go to my next slide here, uh, in particular, took that awareness to different levels in the caricatures that they published of Ruskin over time. So, um, this uh, this from Punch from 1876 uh, is the focus, of course, of the piece is on Ruskin's view of the railways. As Maidman states, the common parodies found of Ruskin and Punch are due in part to the, quote, dual sense of extreme style pulling against extreme views. 
And you certainly see this here. The depiction of Ruskin is typical for a Ruskin caricature, a large head emphasizing his brain and thought on a skittier body. Um, and their stylistic choices that emphasize Ruskin's position as a thinker, but also problematize his body. There is a vein of thought happening in pedagogical work today about making sure that learners are not seen or thought of as brains on sticks. And Susan Rock talks a lot about this in her work. Um, but here we have the same thing happening with Ruskin. He is nothing more than his mind. And yet what Maidenman calls half humorous, half heroic here, Ruskin stands between the leveler's gauge, the tape measure, and the steam train on the one hand, and symbolic devices suggesting the unspoilt lake country on the other. We see Ruskin holding a palette and a palette's knife as weapons. It suggests here that art is here to save you, according to Ruskin, and the weapons that he is given to hold in his hand, along with his bodily color tube, are the literal embodiment of the source of painting. He's, he's ready to wage war with paint. Punch created a parody poem to accompany this piece. But it's interesting how Ruskin's words are not what he wields here, but rather tools of art. As Maidman notes, it's common for Ruskin to be depicted in Victorian cartoons as having this massively handsome head perched on incongruous feeble bodies um, to show the overdevelopment and teeming brain and conflict with physical weakness. And it's always some focus on the hands, the touch, what he's holding that seems to be there as well. So here's another depiction from 1880 of Ruskin as Narcissus. And of course, here we see a more, I, dare, dare I say, evenly drawn um, Ruskin, except for maybe his nose, um, staring in the water. Um, and there's a memorial to Turner behind him. We also see papers with the words engineering, mechanic, steam engine, and an altar. What I find particularly interesting in this image is that he's touching the water. Caravaggio's Narcissus doesn't do this. And so Ruskin needing to break the surface here, again, sort of suggests that it's not purely a moment of vision, but also a moment of touch. Being in touch with himself, maybe. Um, maybe too much, in fact. <laughs> and so here, here I have another one, uh, the modern art professor. We were just talking about the Morgan. This comes from the Morgan uh, website. And again, we have Ruskin here with something in his hands. He is literally tooting his own horn, um, where we have uh, one horn uh, with the words uh, lectures at Oxford 1877, where he plays the dulcet tones of self, self, self. And then in the other horn, he has a flag that says modern painters and the words Turner, Turner, Turner coming out. And though these three drawings are, are caricatures that seem to characterize Ruskin in different ways, it's fascinating that in all of them, he's, he's holding something. There's a focus on what his hands are doing. His hands are doing something, holding weapons, pens, not pens, but pallets, um, not holding books, but horns. Ruskin's fascination and study of geology forms an important basis of the tactile in his work for his emotion. It's sort of an emotional, rhetorical, representational response in his art and his nature and, and his nature. Uh, drawings as well. It's almost as though these drawings were pulling from what Ruskin said in the elements of drawing, which is, quote, the real difficulty and masterliness is the never letting the hand be free, but keeping it under entire control. For Ruskin, the aesthetic experience is always a battle between visual, visual observation and a physical recall, recording that demonstrates that masterliness over the hand and an emotional response. Later he says, quote, you must stop that hand of yours, however painfully, make it understand that it is not to have its own way anymore, that it shall never more slip from one touch to another without orders. Otherwise it is not you who are the master, but your fingers. And so these drawings seem to draw our attention to what is in his hands, what the fingers are mastering, while covertly painting what Ruskin has done in terms of his work and his aesthetics and social values. So, you know, none of that is there. It's just basically what he's holding. The first two are clearly not necessarily ethical depictions of Ruskin. I mean, that could be argued. Nor is that what Punch is trying to get at. Yet there's something to be said about these choices and trying to depict 
you know, someone who's best known for his thought about arts and, you know, social, social justice as a way that he emphasizes only the thing or the thing himself or the thing that he is touching. So this takes us to Ruskin on screen. So some of you had mentioned beforehand that you had not seen Desperate Romantics. I'll just take a sip here. And I am the proud owner of the DVD set. Um, and it's, um, it's, it's, an interesting, uh, it's an interesting series. Um, Ruskin demonstrates an active aesthetic response in his art and his criticism. Um, and he doesn't seem to be afraid of touch there. In fact, he seems to embrace it. However, it's precisely this aesthetic response that is misunderstood in the representations of Ruskin by Joshua McGuire and Mr. Turner, which is from 2014, and Tom Hollander here in Desperate Romantics in 2009. McGuire and Hollander both portray Ruskin as someone who has a fear of touch, a fear of getting too close, while actively glossing over the ever-present tactile aesthetics in Ruskin's own art artistic work and criticism. So in this mini series, The Desperate Romantics, we're given a Ruskin who is found shrinking away from touch. And I'm gonna describe some scenes to you. I, don't, um, I couldn't find any on, online to show you, but I'm gonna describe some scenes to you and you'll get the idea. In the first episode, the first scene we have of Ruskin is in the bedroom. Ruskin is on his knees and he's praying before bed as Effie is, getting, is already in bed and she's sleeping. When he gets into bed, she turns to him and touches his shoulder. When she does so, he turns, gets up, and gets out of bed and leaves the room. The next scene, we see him in his office, looking at Turner's erotic sketches, which he has pulled from his desk drawer. And after carefully examining the tactility, the sexuality, the sensuality present in these sketches, he throws them into the fire to burn. This Ruskin is one that does not want to be touched and his aesthetics and ethics emphasize an avoidance of tactile contact. In the same first episode, we see Rossetti showing him an unfinished piece. Unimpressed, Ruskin walks away, but Rossetti insists that his next, next piece will be better. And this Gabriel was speaking about this before we started this sort of like, I promise I'll do better. I promise this will be better. And he says, uh, my next piece is about the fallen woman. And Ruskin says, there is possibly no greater subject than the fallen woman. Um, and when Rossetti continues, he says, and in the foreground, a merchant will be gripping his hands, his wife's hand thus. And the met mention of touch and emotion seems to disturb Ruskin in the scene. And there's like this visible shiver. The next depiction of Ruskin is him back in the bedroom again, where there is a heated discussion with Effie who insists that she needs more to their relationship. And of course, this is the narrative of the story that has become the central focus on, on, of who Ruskin is in, in media. When Effie uh, then describes and gives him some sort of ammunition um, in this discussion, which is almost like an accountant's ledger of physical interaction. And this is a, this, this scene is too much. Quote, we've been married for five years. And in that time, you have kissed my shoulder four times, cupped my breast in your hand twice, and once nuzzled my neck and whimpered like a dog, end quote. So Ruskin leaves the room and the subsequent scenes with him and Effie and him and Lizzie Siddle demonstrate this unease of proximity to these women. It's kind of over the top. Um, being in the same room with them, being too close is dangerous. So in the last episode of Desperate Romantics, which is episode six, because it's a six part uh, mini series, Rossetti comes to speak to Ruskin and to talk to him about taking Lizzie on again as a student. And the dialogue in that scene is very telling of this story. You know, Ruskin presses, uh, Rossetti presses, presses Ruskin about his relationship with Rose Latouche. And he responds, is Franz in this way, quote, let me tell you what I like, Gabriel. I like the company of children and of young people, and I like art. I love art and ideas and nature. And as for the rest, the inappropriate appetites, the sexual desire, it is not something I feel, end quote. And in fact, Ruskin then turns around and accuses Rossetti of actually being a damaged man because he has no control over his feelings. And so this depiction of Ruskin seems to conflate the aspects of feeling here, feeling 
as emotion, feeling as literal touch. There are certainly an aesthetics of feeling in Ruskin's work, a feeling related to synesthetic dimensions of visual observations leading to an aesthetic response through tactile means, hands on paper, the touch of drawing. His feeling allows us to feel, allows him to feel. And erasing one aspect of feeling for the other actually gives us a very incomplete and unethical picture of Ruskin. It gives us Ruskin as caricature. And instead of Ruskin as artist and Ruskin as critic, and Ruskin as historical figure, all we are left with is this. So it gives us a, a sensory deprived Ruskin. And of course, it's not the first time that we see this in modern representations. And so this is where we go to Effie Gray. And so um, I'm going to play uh, the trailer of Effie. Let me just uh, increase my screen here. And please do let me know if you cannot hear the sound or if you need me to turn up the volume. She's not happy. No more were you at the beginning. Very grim you were. Well, you were pompous. True. And distant. <laughs> you have married no ordinary man. To put it simply, gentlemen, paint what you see. Draw what you see. to get away from their clutches. Your husband disapproves of pleasure, but you do not. In my opinion, there's nothing wrong with your wife. The simple love and attention will not cure. Oh. You don't want to kill me. She means to poison me. You belong in the asylum. Stop. Go back. The pains of eternal torment could be no worse than returning with you. Okay. Again with the over the topness. So let me go back to my slides here. So sadly, the push to forget or ignore the tactile in Ruskin is bound up in this sort of historical depiction. Um, yes, and Robert does get, <laughs> does get a credit in the movie. Um, and so the, in Effie Gray, uh, which is the focus of this uh, 2014 movie directed by Emma Thompson, this is ultimate, like this is the ultimate, the story of the story of Ruskin. You know, Ruskin is often depicted here as someone who actively avoids touch, who sees touch as immoral, unethical. Here, Greg, Greg Wise uh, plays into that wholeheartedly. It's, and you can see um, just from the trailer that it's a very sort of sensory filled film, right? There's something tactile about it, even from the very first scenes, which shows Effie going for a walk and she has her arms outstretched and she's touching the plants as she goes, right? She can't just walk, she needs to touch things as she's going. Um, and Ruskin's first line is also the line that we see in, in this trailer, which is quote, uh, nature must rule every stroke of your brush, paint what you see, draw what you see, end quote. And it's a line that kind of sets the scene for the remainder of the movie. Nature rules strokes and nature rules touch. So one of the earlier scenes after they're married on their way to Denmark Hill on a train, 
Effie notes that this is the first time that they've never that they've ever had time alone. And Ruskin, as soon as she says this, Ruskin asks her to close her eyes, and then he brushes her, his hands over his eye over her eyes, and just says "perfect." And it's a scene that's kind of an example of how Effie Gray as a film displaces seeing for touching. And as I'm arguing here, causes depictions of Ruskins to become caricatures and unethical depictions, not true to the history that is much more complex and needing of more context that is missing. It's a powerful scene because for someone who's so invested in drawing and you know drawing what you see, he asks Effie to close her eyes and then he literally obstructs that sense with his, you know, his hands kind of floating over her eyes. He's reinscribing touch as the primary means for both him to engage and actively withdraw to that connection. When they arrive at Denmark Hill, Ruskin tells George the butler to take Effie by the hand and not be shy. Ruskin seems good at asking others to engage in a tactile way with Effie, but not himself. When Mrs. Ruskin sees his, her son back, she's so happy indeed, and the mother comes and rushes him off, and the father tells Effie, quote, oh, she's been aching to get her hands on him, end quote. The very sort of tactile, touch-laden beginning of the movie highlights just how important touch will be to the setting of the scenes throughout the movie, which of course, as the trailer shows, is all about the story. Um, at one of the first meals together, it's a really um, interesting scene. Uh, Ruskin reaches out and grabs his mother by the hand and she's seated to the left of him. And then he grabs his wife who's seated at the right by the hand. And as soon as he is touching both hands simultaneously in some kind of like tactile completing of the circuit, all of a sudden he starts coughing and, and you know, he needs to uh, he needs to leave the leave, leave the the space, and the mother rushes to get him some water, and Effie wants to help, and the father said, "Oh no, no." So it's somehow this completing of this tactile circuit that seems to be like too much for Ruskin. He can't touch his mother and his wife at the same time. Apparently, he cannot deal with that too much contact at the same time, according to this movie. Um, as Effie becomes accustomed to married life and I'm sure what to do with her day, she tells John, I can help you with your work. And he's like, oh no, you know what? Go and see mom, my mother in the garden. And so when, and when Effie goes down to the garden and the mother, as we see in, this, in the trailer, she's tending to her roses. Um, she says, well, Ruskin, you know, John sent me to help you. And she turns around with this face and says, he knows that no one touches my roses. So, um, there are limits and barriers to touch here. There's a possession of space and objects through touch, but there's also limits of what one is allowed to do and what one is allowed to touch. When Effie first meets the East Lakes, there are many pre paintings shown, but the one uh, that is focused before dinner is, is this, is Malay's uh, The Order of the Release, um, which also happens to be one of my favorite paintings um, because of the emphasis, you guessed it, on touch. Uh, the way that the husband's hand is held by the wife and how even the dog needs to get into the reunion somehow um, is really a powerful one for someone who, who studies tactility. Um, another piece that's in that same scene, let me just, is um, Holman Hunt's, a Valentine rescuing uh, Sylvia from Proteus. And as we see from the trailer, this connection between the East Lakes is one of a connection where they're, they're, they're capable and they're comfortable with showing um, affection physically with each other. There's kissing, there's hugging. And this is contrasted with all the other types of touch that Effie and Ruskin experience. You know, we even hear Lady Eastlake saying how Effie needs to be taken away from their clutches, right? There's this constant return to what is held and what is grasped and what is avoided. So the film then moves us to a trip to Venice and Ruskin's tactile encounters there with engraved figures on columns. And he shows Effie and he shows and he talks about how tenderly they're formed. And he demonstrates almost more of a connection to the built environment than he does to his own wife. He rubs the columns many times and touches them much more than we've seen him touch any single thing throughout the entire movie so far. Thompson here has created Ruskin as someone so engrossed in his work that it's the only thing of value. 
the lines that she's given him, uh, the hostility that he speaks and he shows towards Effie throughout the film erases any sort of social political care that he has demonstrated in his work that we know that he has demonstrated in his work. While Ruskin is trying everything he can to not touch Effie, um, Raphael here, and which we also see in the trailer, is you know trying to take every opportunity that he, that he can to touch her. He wants to teach her how to how to uh, help guide the gondola, um, and what should have been, if we want to take the liberty here, an experiential learning opportunity, it turns into a, a forbidden touch. And here it's Effie who actively runs away from this unwanted touch. Um, as she tries to process what happens, she curls up in bed and she looks at her hand in the sunlight like so and screams, which we also see um, in the trailer. It's almost as though it's an acknowledgement about how much touch and hands are both causes of pain and a missing connection here. On their return to England, the doctor says to Ruskin, you need a sharper eye and a keener ear. Again, you know, sensory valencies there. Um, and how he's particularly sort of sensory deprived when it comes to his wife. Um, when she is better, Ruskin tries to ask her what she's thinking. And when she gets closer and she tries to touch him, we have this scene where he basically grabs her and it turns into violent touch. Um, and so I can see why some of you maybe have taken the choice to not watch this movie. Um, <laughs> Sarah is, Sarah is nodding. Um, so it, it turns into this, this sort of violent touch, right? And then from there, we're taken to Scotland with Effie and Ruskin and Malay to help Effie get better. And so that Malay can paint Ruskin's portrait. And here we see Ruskin's anaphia is not limited to, to Effie alone. In the cold, Malay says that he has to stop painting because his fingers are refusing to bend. And then Ruskin says, oh, let me help you. And you know, you think that he's actually gonna help Malay. And instead he just grabs the canvas and he takes it home. Um, so like, that's his idea of helping. Um, so clearly there's something here of value. And the thing that's of value is whatever's connected to him and not to others. And so what has to happen then is again, the scene that we see in the trailer because Effie helps nurse Malay back when he's not feeling well. There's the scene that we see in the trailer where Malay touches Effie's hand in a way, sort of trying to give her connection, trying to give her the touch that she's saying that she's not getting from her husband. When they return to England, Effie visit, visits Lady Eastlake and it centers all around how he has never touched her, never made her his wife. And we see on this lack of sort of physicality that has been created um, by Thompson in each scene, um, we see annulment proceedings and the lawyer is um, played by Derek Jacoby. Um, and he tells her to stay away so that there's not any accidental touch that could ruin the chances of annulment. As the movie ends and Effie is leaving with her sister and Ruskin is being sort of served these annulment papers by the lawyer, the final scene is Effie sort of touching her hand to the carriage window like so um, as they drive away where the window and the distance kind of act as a barrier and then it's kind of like end scene. So, you know, for those of you who chose not to not to see this movie, now you have a good reason why. And and now I've I've given you all the salient points. You you don't you don't need to put yourself through that if you don't if you choose not to. <laughs> Sarah's giving me a thumbs up. Um, so now now we'll go to um, now we'll go to to Mr. Turner, um, and I want to play a little bit of the trailer from Mr. Turner. Let's make make this, and there we go. Thank you, Mr. Turner. My little lad could draw. I thought he could read and write. Is that who? <laughs> Constable. Turner. You're still making your nice little pictures, Mr. Turner. <laughs> You'd make a fine subject for you to paint. Oh, is that so? I shall cogitate upon it. <laughs> when I experience a masterpiece such as yours, 
I'm struck by the clarity with which you have captured the moment. Why on earth would he go and do that? He's ruined a masterpiece. Eyesight. The masterpiece I here present is the turn has just sent. I believe you to be a man of great spirit and fine feeling. The universe is chaotic and you make us see it. Great vision, Mr. Tanner. Okay. Um, let me go back to my. Here we go. All right. I, 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 I physically, I literally saw Sarah cringe uh, in that in the trailer part when when Ruskin came up. So, so there we go. So here we have yet another poor depiction of Ruskin <laughs> in Mike Lee's Mr. Turner, which is also from uh, 2014. A bumper crop in 2014 of bad Ruskin depictions, which I will talk to uh, in a moment. The connection between Turner and Ruskin is poorly explored in this film. And though one can understand that the main focus of the movie is Turner himself, there are actually only three instances where Ruskin appears in this film. So if you're going to see Mr. Turner to try to find Ruskin, you're not going to find a lot of him. Um, and it's a two and a half hour movie, so that's actually not a lot at all. So of the three scenes, in two, uh, Ruskin is seen on the screen, and then in the third, you can actually just hear him in conversation, but you actually don't get to see him on the screen. The only person that you do see is Effie. So in the brief representation of Ruskin in this uh, clip, uh, we see uh, McGuire here with the blue neckcloth in the scene um, as a nod to the self-portrait that I will turn to at the end. Um, in the scene, lisping Ruskin states to a seemingly disinterested Turner, when I experience a masterpiece such as yours, I'm struck by the clarity with which you've captured the moment. And at least Lee uh, got something right in his emphasis on Ruskin uh, experiencing the art, but how it's portrayed is another story. For Ruskin, art was an experience, and we have seen this in his own work. Uh, even in modern painters, Ruskin states that he has an instant conviction that Turner was as much of a geologist as he was uh, a painter. And so this sort of natural re referent actually comes up in the movie when Ruskin asks the company in his home in that same scene to talk about seas and oceans and art. And he speaks of Claude Lorraine as uninspiring and how his work is a mere collection of precise brushstrokes. And this focus on the precision of the tactile brushstrokes and the art of the moment, uh, Turner calls Lorraine a man of his time, uh, seems to be at odds with what Mrs. Ruskin, his mother is saying about Ruskin, where she says, oh, you know, my son, when he was four, he was fascinated by waves because he said, quote, they were always coming and going and never seen for a second, end quote. So this kind of almost Bergsonian understanding of the durée of waves, a deep uh, moment of insight is undercut at the end of this same scene when Ruskin gets up as he is there and he kind of positions himself in this glimmering sunlight of the room in a pose kind of awaiting a question from Turner, uh, which he feels is going to be of deep artistic importance. And then instead, Timothy Spall as Turner delivers the following question. To which do you find yourself more partial? Steak and kidney pie or veal and ham pie? And so clearly Ruskin here is like sort of the butt of the jokes. Even in the first scene, when we meet Ruskin for the first time with his father at Turner's home, he's overlooking the slave ship and he's kind of, um, paint splaining, I guess is what the kids would say now, uh, the painting back to Turner, um, highlighting the white and scarlet, the camera sort of pans to Hannah, who's Turner's housekeeper, who's kind of there scratching her shoulder. So instead of focusing on what Ruskin is saying about Turner's work, Turner interrupts Ruskin and asks Hannah to kind of shake out the blue bottle flies that are in the tarp in the ceiling and they're di disrupting the light. 
So it's not Ruskin's interpretation of Turner's work that's important here in the scene, but rather the sort of visceral experience of the body that, that Hannah is having. Um, in the last scene featuring Ruskin, this is the one where he's not on screen and instead the camera focuses on a drunk Turner who's kind of struggling with dessert and Ruskin is heard off screen talking about Effie's talents that lies dormant and needs to be drawn out. And Effie is sitting beside Turner and Turner stops struggling with his dessert and looks at her and his hands sort of waving in front of her face like this and says, uh, like he's drawing a curtain and he's like sublime. And then he continues after a pause and he says, loneliness and solitude are not the same. And then he looks at her and like earnestly and says, love will come. And so even while off screen, this picture of Ruskin here is like sort of this unloving critic and capable of separating, you know, criticism from love, at least when it comes in relationships. So when these two films were released, a piece by Philip Hoare was published in The Guardian in October 7th of 2014, and it was entitled, John Ruskin, Mike Lee, and Emma Thompson have, gotten, <laughs> have got him all wrong. And he asks why Ruskin has been, quote, reduced to a prude and a flop in two new films. Um, so similar to what you were saying before, Gabriel. Um, he starts um, his piece uh, with the following. On behalf of John Ruskin, I would like to sue Mike Lee for defamation of character, um, where he notes that uh, Maguire's portrayal is, quote, a simmering back adderish caricature of an art intellectual, a lisping redheaded salon fob. And I mean, look, I'm all for a nice dandy portrayal in a movie, but as Hoare points out, this particular depiction is very unethical and misleading. And he asks, why can't we cope with Ruskin's genius? which seems to be the origin of all of this misinterpretation and all of these characters. How can you portray a man known for his prose and his art in his own right in a way that the general public will understand? The answer is this push towards anti-intellectualism and to cut off Ruskin from any sensory connection, to give him an aphia in most scenes and to focus only on the scandalous story instead of focusing on his social political thought and how he wanted to move society forward in a collective ethical way that supports workers. So when the bicentenary came, many articles on Ruskin in newspapers and magazines focusing on art and architecture and design came out. Uh, Scott Rayburn notes in a February 6, 2019 issue of the New York Times, quote, time has not been kind to the reput representation or reputation of Ruskin. Rayburn goes on to talk about the story as being the only way folk know Ruskin, no thanks to Mr. Turner and Effie Gray, yet he does reinforce how he encouraged workers to improve their lives through self-education. And the same sort of motivation and push towards experiential learning is the same thing that had me interested in Ruskin all those years ago when I first read The Ethics of the Dust. Rayburn uh, notes that the evangelical density of Ruskin's prose can intimidate. But as Robert Hewson, has, who's also cited in this Times piece points out, Ruskin's art is always seen as a more accessible way to get a sense of the man. That's the words that, that um, Hewson used. It's one, it's often to Ruskin's art that I point folk when they need to be, in, they're interested. And because I would agree with Professor Hewson that Ruskin's art is more accessible than his prose for many. Yet it is interesting that in visual art and in screen media, Ruskin's depictions have worked to push his thought and work further away from the audience and set Ruskin up as someone who would never be really known for his art or his thought. Larry Ryan in a Guardian piece from August 30th, 2018 notes that for Ruskin quote, a society founded on structures that are embroiled and heartless in brutal treatment of people and the environment around them is indifferent to beauty. And I would say these scenes and these depictions of Ruskin are seemingly heartless as well and brutal treatment. As Hewison mentions in an article in the Irish Times, it is the interdisciplinary nature of Ruskin that allowed him to be reclaimed in the 60s, and the bicentenary has allowed folk to rediscover the radicalism encased in his ideas. And yet, that encasement, that need to put Ruskin in that one singular box that has done the most unethical damage on how he is viewed and received outside of academic and artistic spaces such as this, is the one that most people see. 
And there is nowhere uh, that that need to move out of boxes and a more ethical framing uh, is seen than in the design and the work of design and Ruskin's uh, thought. So here I'm actually going you know, to point to something positive to, to end here. In a Fast Company article by Ryan, Brian Miller um, from February 2019, he highlights the many things that designers can learn from Ruskin. Um, and so already we're in a better spot. Uh, Miller frames his piece by speaking to Ruskin's ethical thought about architecture and a very general public type phrasing of Ruskin's work. He's really writing to a general audience here, and I love it. He says, quote, if you, Ruskin would feel, if you work in a dump, chances are the owners of your company don't care much about you. And as someone who has worked in some pretty ugly colleges with some pretty bad office space and equally poor labor practices, I would tend to agree. This whole article by Miller is great, in my opinion, because it really makes Ruskin accessible to the general public. It has biting rhetoric, and I can't help but feel that Ruskin would actually appreciate this article. Um, on Ruskin's lecture, Traffic, Miller says, quote, Ruskin's lecture immortalizes traffic, doesn't so much bite the hand that feeds him, it cooks it with some fava beans and a nice Chianti. So who knew? that maybe a way to a more ethical Ruskinian depiction and a Renaissance would be more references to Silence of the Lambs. Uh, <laughs> now, Miller says, if Ruskin were alive today, I think he would be less interested in your Instagram or LinkedIn profile, but he would judge you by your Pinterest board. And I would tend to agree with this insight as well, because you know, it would be about what the useful and beautiful things that you had created on your Pinterest and not so much the public persona that is so far from the truth that we see with Instagram influencers or how many micro credentials you did on LinkedIn um, to add to your homepage. As someone who spends a ridiculous amount of time on Twitter, and I mean like a ridiculous amount of time on Twitter, I often wonder what Ruskin would think of it. I'd like to think that, you know, if you enjoy Pinterest, then he'd probably enjoy Twitter just as much, and maybe I'm trying to make myself feel better, um, as a curated space of knowledge exchange, right? As long as billionaires that don't invest in it and turn it into a space of hatred. Um, TikTok, I know for sure that he would probably not understand because it's not a type of space that builds arguments. Ruskin is not a man for a sound bite. Uh, he needs space to form a well thought out argument. And as Miller states, quote, he basically invented the TED talk in 1870. So um, I really, this Miller piece, I'm gonna, I'll give you the reference at the end. Um, he does a really great job of referencing a lot of the characters we're talking about here. And he ends with the challenge for the next generation of designers is to make products that benefit the people who make them and the planet that sustains us. A guy born 200 years ago this week has some pretty fresh ideas about how we can do that. And that's how he ends his time. So in conclusion, um, I want to leave us with, you know, let's, let's leave us with something nice to actually look at and think about. Here we go. Um, I want to address uh, this self-painting uh, from 1873. This painting was chosen to greet patrons in the Artist Observer and Observer exhibition. And I will admit that I had a very difficult time pulling myself away from this to see other pieces. I think one of the reasons why I love this painting so much is that, well, it's like Ruskin is Ruskin. No media filters, no stories, just him and a neck cloth. As well, for me, this is a really great representation of Ruskin's tactility and the need for depictions of Ruskin. This portrait, you know, Jim has talked about this too, conveys a spectrum of feeling and, off, and also makes present this introspective ability, the need to see uh, and to have a good self-portrait. You know, two eyes, one lighted, one shaded, are indicative of pain and tenderness, yet there's a precision in that detail of the hair, the shades of gray and white. Yet the dark side is more uniform in that precision, the touching of the paper, the strokes of the brush less distinct. The separation of the face from the blue neckcloth is defined, as defined as we would see in his geological sketches, separating man from cloth, spiritual from material, maybe even separating touch from sight. Uh, as he said in the Stones of Venice, the whole function of the artist of the, uh, in the world is to be seeing and a seeing and feeling creature. And there seems to be no more of a, ceiling, a seeing and feeling creature than in this po uh, portrait. His look touches us from afar through history, reminding us that being an observer requires just as much tactile awareness as visual acumen. 
So as I end with this portrait and with Ruskin kind of staring at us and reminding us that there's more sensory to his work than the visual, I, often, I also wanna note that to have more access to Ruskin, we need more articles like Miller's and less movie depictions like Thompson's. <laughs> and as I noted, we really, I really do believe that Ruskin's art is the way to make him more accessible, but in doing so, we need to make his art in a way that's shareable and accessible. As I noted at the beginning, because um, I give this talk because I really like, care about the importance of Ruskin and his work and to make his work accessible to non-academic audiences and to different non-privileged folk. I want Ruskin to stop being gatekept by us. Yes, he's a great secret, but isn't he a secret that deserves to be shared? Like the amount of time I spend on Twitter reminding people to alt text their images, which means we, you put a description of what the images are that they share with others so that folks that are blind or have low vision or use a screen reader for any reason can receive the same information without visual bias. I want to spend the last minutes here in reflection and asking you, how can we bring Ruskin to others in an accessible way? Miller's article is but one way, sharing Ruskin on social media in an accessible way is another. And I want to highlight here the excellent work that the Ruskin and the Royal Society did with painting with sunlight, Ruskin and science in that Google space, fantastic work. Really opened up many aspects of Ruskin's work to more general audience. And they're continuing to do that work on Twitter. They all text his images. They, they say where it's from. I share it on the, the, the society's Twitter all the time. So how can we make Ruskin and an ethical version of Ruskin at that not one of caricatures and mockery, part of the world that really needs him and not gatekept by us in these spaces. I hope that we can have a discussion about that this evening and I hope you enjoyed my talk. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Anne. Um, I can tell you, I enjoy your talk immensely. Actually, I've been making notes while you were talking here. Um, I, I love that paint splaining. That's great. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go on and use that. I think um, that's excellent. But you had so much to say, and that really made me think about the fact that you know Ruskin for me, I've always thought of him as tactile. But then I was thinking that when people write about Ruskin, um, often, as you say, there's a focus on mainly on the visual. Um, or on the philosophical, if we're talking about, you know, his ideas about whether it's art or, or society. And yet the work of the hands is so important to Ruskin. It's something that he does talk about. So, you know, I agree with you. And I hadn't really thought about it in those terms before that, I mean, I think of Ruskin in those terms all the time. But the fact that when he's presented to the public, often that is not something that is stressed as much as it, as it needs to be. Um, I was also thinking as you were talking about different visual depictions of him. I don't know if you're familiar, if anyone is familiar with Max Beerbaum's um, picture of Ruskin meeting meeting um, Fanny Cornforth. Rossetti is introducing Ruskin to Fanny Cornforth. Yeah. And what is that all about? But Ruskin's resistance to the physical, right? I mean, it's also, you know, she's she's not someone who's presentable socially, but also it's about that resistance. She's a very physical presence. She's, you know, she's a large presence. She's a, um, you know, energetic presence and he's shrinking away from that. And it shows him exactly as you were talking about, you know, mm -hmm. shrinking away from the, from the tactile. Yeah. So I was thinking about that as well. Um, and I love that you brought up Philip who I actually know and oh talk about synchronicities because I just asked Gabriel if I could invite him to do a talk for us so he will be doing a talk for us in the new year um, and that article that he wrote about Ruskin you know defending him from those films is really fantastic if if, if you aren't familiar with it I encourage you all to, to look it up yeah I uh, I dropped in the chat the work cited so if you need the oh, links to that to that article that horror article or the Miller article from Fast Company mm -hmm. that I was referring to that mm -hmm. you have the links to that in that pdf as well. Yeah. Thank you for giving those to everyone because those are all well, those articles that you mentioned are all really worth reading I think you'll all enjoy them. Yeah. So anyway thanks for a, a wonderful talk that gave us so much to think about um, and thank you for saving me from having to ever watch those movies. Um, that was <laughs> I never did plan to, but now, you know, I know that I made the right decision. So that's good. Um, and, you know, I have to say, I didn't know the, that um, I'm going to forget his name right now, who plays Ruskin in Desperate Romantics, Tom uh, Hollander. Um, Hollander. I really like him. So I'm actually disappointed to learn that 
he played Ruskin because I like watching his films, but that's one I'm just not going to, I'm going to miss that one out. So, right. um, but I do want to open, you know, questions for anyone who has or, or comments or anyone who has things that they, they'd like to say. I'm sure we all are thinking about a lot of things um, after listening to Anne's talk. So uh, if anyone want, has a question for Anne or something they would just like to comment about um, in the talk, you know, please, you can put a hand up. There's reactions down on your screen. You can put a hand up or you can put your actual hand up, which is also great. And in a talk like this, it's Great to you know be putting your hand up. That's what we're talking about, Gabriel. That's right. Yeah, just a, um, a comment. Um, when you read uh, contemporary sources about Ruskin's teaching, thinking about Anne's points about pedagogy, I mean you can't but think of of hyper tactility. Um, Hausman's mm -hmm. great description in a letter to to his uh, to his father about attending one of Ruskin's uh, slave lectures, you know, and the, the idea of Ruskin striding across the stage uh, right. with these great gestures and then taking a copy of uh, a Turner painting, putting glass in front of it, and then taking paint, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, and displaying various structural aspects and uh, so forth. Um, the, the, all the, the whole impression we get, especially of Ruskin's lectures and his pedagogy, is you know hyper engaged and and passionate. Uh, nothing of the uh, of the shy, reserved, you know, uh, retreating uh, figure. So I you know I think this is um, all of the contemporary sources that we have paint a, a, a very different picture. Yeah. Well, and and here's a man who you know. They spent a lot of times, you know, climbing and tramping about in the Alps, you know, and yes. and, in, and interacting with things. And you talked about, um, you know, his interest in mineralogy and botany and all of these things. I mean, mm -hmm. those are all highly tactile too. Um, and so, I think I'm thinking after listening to you, as I said a little bit earlier, that because I know this about Ruskin, I assume that other people do, but they don't. So yeah. yeah, and it's it, and I mean they they don't like if you're not in an if you're not in an academic environment if you haven't read read a lot of Ruskin mm -hmm. that this is what like I mean this is what's given out there for public consumption right? right it's not like it's not the fact that he has drawn like the most amazing geological sketches or or nature or any of that it's it's this it's this stuff and it's not yes. it's not great <laughs> yeah Elena so you have a hand up go ahead. You're on mute though, Elena, so you just need to unmute yourself. Are uh, you not able to? Okay, can someone, Gabriel, I don't know if you can unmute Elena. I can't seem to do it from here. No, I can't, I can't. Okay. I'm seeing a couple of things in the chat as we try to unmute Elena. Yeah. Um, I agree. I agree. It's a great movie about Mr. Turner. Absolutely. Despite the inaccuracies of Ruskin. Um, I'm unsure if this question is to me, but no, I have never spoken at, at the Huntington. Um, I, I did, but I don't Sarah, know if that was Sarah, to you or to me. Yeah, um, Sarah did. Sarah yeah. did. I, I usually just stay in Canada. <laughs> Elena. Yeah, no, this is a t I, wonderful, um, wonderful talk and lecture and, and choices, I think. Um, I also took a lot of notes. There was one thing in the beginning, you mentioned um, Bloomsbury. Can you, I mean, I know I can rewatch this, but what was yeah. the reference to Bloomsbury? I'm, I'm very fascinated with this concept of psychogeography. I like, um, I don't get to go to England very often because it's far and it's money that I don't have. Um, but when I do get to go to England, I always go to Bloomsbury and I just want to walk around and like just be in space. And right. so I feel like Wolf's sort of like Bloomsbury psychogeography is something that I always I always kind of have in the back of my mind as something that I care about as a Victorianist, but it's also exactly, I love street haunting, but it's also something that I bring to the work that I do every day because I ask instructors to think, how do the students feel in this space? Like, do they feel like, is this a space they wanna be in? Even in virtual space, is this a space you wanna be in? Have, have I made this space in the way that I've engaged a, a space that you wanna be in, or is it a space where you don't right and so that psychogeography piece okay really, that was the word yeah. I was looking for yeah, yeah that's great I yeah. love that okay thank you yeah, wonderful thank you 
And and this is Jim. Can you can you hear me? I can, Jim. Okay, I, I, I it's just a, really an observation. It's one you've probably heard from me before. It is my conviction. It has been my conviction for a long time and remains it that the real problem with making Ruskin accessible to more people more easily is that we're intimidated by him. We're intimidated yes. by the we're intimidated by the prose. We're intimidated by his reputation. We are uh, all compromised by what you call the story, and he doesn't fit the modern, the modern uh, notion of somebody who's, uh, let's say, sexually active and, and enormously sensual in the, how he lives his life. Yep. Ruskin, a Ruskin frightens us, and so I think that the, I've always thought that the real solution is just to sit down and decide to to read Ruskin, just take a take like the first volume of Modern Painters or the Seven Lamps of Architecture and just slowly begin to read it and let it sink in because he's clear enough in what he says. There's nothing, uh, nothing frightening in what he says. It just challenges us to come to the essence of an understanding of something like architecture or painting or whatever. So my sense is that we still are afraid of him. And so we'll, we'll find anything we can to uh, denigrate him or put him in a, in a box, as you called it earlier, yeah. so we don't have to take him seriously. I think Mike Lee did that in his film. I think Emma Thompson did that in her film. They 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 do great disservice to Ruskin because fundamentally they don't understand him and they did not take the time to understand him. So f finally, and, and and the bottom and the short of this comment is, I still think he frightens us. Yes. Yeah, no, Jim, I, I, I very much agree. And I also agree with this idea that we want to we want to read him. But again, like putting like sort of my educational developer pedagogy hat on, I feel like we need to find ways to make that reading accessible, because we're not in a space and the learners are not in the space that they were before. This pandemic has done something and has opened a light uh, has 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 like really enlightened uh, where we are, um, where education is, and where learners are. And gone are the days where like you could open I don't know seven lamps or something and get them to read it because they're just it'll you know. And so if you have a professor who wants to take seven lamps and create a TikTok, then or like many TikToks, then maybe we have something. So um, we need to find that like that gap, right? We need to find the bridge between let's read all of Seven Lamps and let's make everything a TikTok. And if we can find that, I think um, we will get more people because attention spans, they've done studies, attention spans have really like really decreased. Um, people touch their phones 2000 times a day, um, which is, outrageous but also yeah seems about right um so i mean i think we need to we really need to get we need to get uh to approach ruskin in a way that the learners today would would get it but yeah yep. Stuart. yeah yeah everybody wants to say something yeah uh you've got to unmute unmute Bev. unmute yeah <laughs> I, I was just going to say you're you're absolutely right. I mean, we find quotes every day in our art literature. Whether it's the, I just found another one in the art newspaper that Anish Kapoor quoted uh, Ruskin. I mean, I you, I see quotes all the time, but it it isn't as he isn't as accessible as we would like him to be. And to that end, actually, our our wonderful new. Um, membership coordinators um, and Elena's son-in-law and daughter are, are going to put um, Chloe and I think she's she's sort of the media person and uh, Andrew is sort of is, is organizing and they're talking about doing little social media drops Teaching yeah. Ruskin. And, and we think yeah. that's really going to reach out because he, I mean, there are phrases, there's just, you know, that, that mm -hmm. turn you on. I mean, we, yeah. we just have to get him out in the world more and we have yeah. to get him to the next generation because he, he does speak to us and, and his responses to what is going on in the world today are 
as relevant as they were in his own time. So absolutely, we're, we will make that effort and see where it leads. Yeah. I and and I, as I as I said towards the end, I think the Ruskin the Ruskin's Twitter account, if you're on Twitter, is fantastic for that. I think they're doing like they're doing some. At the beginning, I was a little bit I was a little bit more hesitant to retweet their things because again, they didn't have the alt text and and I think about like you know how blind and low vision and folk that use screen readers, how are they engaging and in in this right? And so with an alt text now, you have a nice description of what of what it is, and so that that account actually in the past few months has really ramped up in terms of their outreach so yeah I think any of that kind of stuff um is great now having <laughs> now having said that I'm not particularly on social media <laughs> right <laughs> well, anyway yeah. um I, I, I thank you for that because I think it's important that we um that we do that and I also just want to note in the chat that there's another Canadian here that I have not met I don't think um and sadly no I've never been the Coniston or Brentwood because no <laughs> you, you must go you'll get there you'll get there one day one day i'll yeah. have vacation <laughs> yeah, I, I wanted to mention that um at the oxford museum which ruskin was part of designing and he, he you know he would he was very seminal figure in the design of that museum and getting it established um but at the oxford museum even to this day um, they have these really great exhibits where they're, they're just, and it, this is also very Ruskinian too, they're little cabinets with drawers in them. Um, and you can pull them out and they have fossils and minerals and all sorts of things that are meant for you to touch. And that's yeah. the whole point. You know, it's this interactive sort of ex um, experience in a museum that you don't often have because usually things are, you know, in vitrines, behind glass. You're not supposed to be touching everything. Right. Um, you know, in Ruskin in the Guild of St. George Museum, I mean, he had... It was, it was an experience where you were supposed to interact with things. I mean, obviously not with, you know, paintings necessarily, but, you know, with the minerals, with other things, yeah. you were supposed to experience that in a sensory way. Yeah. Um, and for someone who is often depicted as having, you know, no sensuality, no sense of, of passion beyond the intellectual, um, he writes about sensuality, you know, in passages in his writing where he talks yeah. about how it's important to have that sort of sensual experience, you know, set meaning sensory, you know, and, and engaging all your senses. So it's, yeah, I, it, it really got me thinking about ways to to bring that out more, you know, in my own work on Ruskin. Yeah. So. Thank you. No, it's, I mean, I know when you like, when you actually study something, you kind of see it everywhere, you know, like when there's a spider in the corner, you're like, oh, spider. Yeah. <laughs> um, but um, I, it's, it's really fascinating to me whenever I pick up something from Ruskin, there's just so much touch there. And, and mm -hmm. as you say, Sarah, I just, I wonder if other people are seeing it or if I'm just seeing it because I'm kind of obsessed with, you know, tactility. <laughs> no, I know. I think it's there. Stuart, yeah. go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just to be a little contrarian uh, <clears throat> to a man with a hammer, all the world is a nail. And I think, Anne, you are a little obsessed with this uh, approach, this lens on Ruskin. And that's fine because it leads you to uh, this pedagogical uh, <clears throat> expertise in a very uh, profound way. And the idea of TikToks leads me to the notion, I remember uh, I represent the estate of Khalil Gibran who wrote The Prophet. And uh, Selma Hayek, who is uh, uh, Me Mexican-Lebanese, uh, produced with the help of other people an animated film of the problem, which is a musical. Uh, and uh, there's uh, to consider that TikToks for Ruskin is a little bit like what my experience was of seeing the prophet as a musical uh, animation. Uh, it right. didn't ring true to me. Yeah. I think it was the hope that uh, um, <laughs> Hayek had that it would reach a great many more people. And it was quite successful, apparently. Box office was quite good. Uh, Don, right. you may even know some of the statistics. I don't know if you do or not, but I think it was pretty successful. Uh, yeah. And, uh, but uh, it occurs to me that if one were to have a, a TikTok in which John Ruskin shows up <laughs> on planet Earth, it would be as if he were from Mars. It's true. Yeah. <laughs> 2022, he'd see these damn phones. He'd, think about the internet, you think about the, the virtuality of things and, and to watch him look at himself as an NFT, uh -huh. completely, <laughs> head would explode. And, and exactly, exactly. Explode. Well, <laughs> so, he would hate almost all of that. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But I think there's grist for this mill that you've sort of structured here for us in terms of making Ruskin accessible. I don't think it's in the direction of uh, an, an animated musical, but it right. may be 
it may be these, these vignettes on social media that we're contemplating could take form and be very, uh, very, very powerful. Yeah, thank you, Stuart. That's, I hope. Yeah. Are any of you familiar with uh, the School of Life? You mentioned Alan de Baton in your yeah. lecture. Um, have you seen his short video? He does short videos um, yes. on the philosophy of different thinkers and writers and artists. And there's one on Ruskin, which is an animated video. And it's I've sent it to students before. It's really well done. It and is. Manages, it's super well done. Yeah. Yeah. If you like, we can maybe put that in the notes and people can look it up. But it really, he manages to get across Ruskin's thinking in an important way. I mean, he's, he's sticking to Ruskin's ideas. He's not, you know, cheapening his ideas or anything like that. But um, the media, the way that it's presented is very inventive. Oh, um, Ruskin, Ruskin gives us language that is so pungent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it'll break down any of the falsity of the medium in which it appears. It right. Just, yeah, that's, that's a really good way Don, to put it, Stuart. To yeah, something. Don had a, had a question. Go ahead, Don. Well, I was just thinking about uh, what Stuart was saying. And as, as a person who's made a lot of animated musicals, um, they are a particular audience. And um, but it's interesting because I'm like, um, and you're you're um, you know, like taken with Twitter, and I'm taken with TikTok. I just watch a lot of TikTok, and I can't tell you why, except they are very humanizing. And I think the other thing that resonated with me in this discussion is Jim's uh, description of Ruskin as being as, as us being afraid of him. And I think that's true. We put him on a pedestal in our. Um, overwhelmed by his work and everything else. And it's it's very inaccessible, I think, especially to the layman out there on the street. It's overwhelmingly uh, inaccessible. And uh, to me, I think what's missing is uh, the opportunity to humanize him because it's it's easy just to say, oh, you know, he uh, he never slept with Effie and that's really the story. Right. That's, that's a modern newspaper headline that is what it is. But I think yeah. if there's a way to humanize him and say, well, yeah, but because if when you go to Coniston and see his place and when you go to when you see his paintings and you see his drawings and you see listen to his lectures and things, uh, he's very sensual, which is yeah. just the opposite of how he's portrayed in movies. He's exactly. portrayed in movies as this creepy off standoffish guy. Yeah. And I think if if there's a way, and I don't have a clue how to do it, but if there's a way to humanize him and say, listen, he put his pants on one leg at a time, but he had mm. this amazing gift of insight into the world that is relevant now. I think that's kind of what what I'm hearing from uh, from everyone. John, I think I think we have to become co-producers of something. Yeah, let's go. I, <laughs> I, I want to make one more comment about, about making Ruskin accessible in, in the context of this. Um, Mike Lee's film, Mr. Turner, as uh, Anne has described very nicely, presents Ruskin in a completely inaccurate. Oh, Jim. Oh, did we lose? Oh, you froze. You froze. Am, am I? I'm still. No, you're back. Yeah, you're back. You're back. Okay. Yeah. So, so, so the, what I wanted to suggest was, and I, I run a Ruskin blog, and when that film came out, I wrote a review of the film, and I tried to counter Mike Lee's view of Ruskin by simply presenting a uh, by excerpting and putting on, on the screen Ruskin's description of Turner's slave ship painting which is one of the great paintings of Turner's work that Ruskin owned. And if we just simply take a little bit of time to walk through the three or four paragraphs of Ruskin's description of Turner's painting, then every the entire lie of Mike Lee's portrait of Ruskin just comes bubbling to the surface and disintegrates because then he, he's, he, he becomes a very serious, brilliant man who takes the world and its issues incredibly uh, deeply, and uh, so that's a way to read Ruskin just in a short passage that helps us understand who he really was. And and you know, Jim, that's exactly like one of the things that I think um, really, you know, to to Don's point about like how do we make it more, how do we make it more accessible? It is through his art or the way that he talks about mm -hmm. art. Because mm -hmm. and I'll give you, I'll give you, you know, again, this is a personal anecdote, um, so it's not like you know a big scientific study. But my father worked at the post office for 25 years. He's not, he's not an academic. He's not like he's, he likes to draw a couple of things, but he's not an artist. And he was visiting me the other day. And on my wall here, I have, um, I have um, a printout of uh, Trees in the Lane, perhaps at Ambleside, which is one of my favorite Ruskins. 
And he was sitting in the chair here and he's like, what's that on the wall? <laughs> and I was like, it's a Ruskin. And he's like, well, what's it about? And so I was explaining it to him. And my father, who knows no idea who Ruskin is or anything like that, all of a sudden he was asking me all these questions. Who's this guy? What did you know? You know, and so you see, like, I think it's through art and Ruskin's art and the way that he talks about art that we can get the folk who have never encountered him before or interested. And he was just like, can you email me a link to that image? I think I want to try and sketch it one day. And I was like, yes, let me do that. And so I emailed him, you know, and so, and it was really great. It made me feel, it was like one of the first times I actually had a conversation about Ruskin with my parents ever. And so it was fantastic. Um, but I think that's it, right? Like I think that's what you're saying, Jim, is that we need to, and to Don's point too, we need to find the thing. We need to find the middle. And maybe the middle is, let's talk about his art instead of asking people to read the stones of Venice or something, which, I mean, we should all read the stones of Venice, but, you know, <laughs> yeah, but, you, but, the, but you're right. There has to be a way, there has to be a way in for people. I mean, if you just hand people yeah. the stones of Venice, most people are going to say, Oh no, these three volumes and it's, it's dense. It's 19th century. And that's what I hear from students sometimes, but I don't, now I don't, I don't go in that way anymore. And yeah. one of the best comments I had recently from a student in an essay was, um, the students said one of the one of my favorite things we read this term was John Ruskin. He seems like a guy I'd really like to spend time with. And nice. I was like, score one for <laughs> Ruskin. Like that's just fantastic, you know. Um, Have a beer. Have a beer so, yeah. 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 Uh, well, or sherry, I guess, and then 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 the students yeah, would know. Yeah. Then the students would know what sherry yes. was about, or something. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Make one comment quickly that uh, Jean Gibran, who is the uh, widow of Khalil Gibran Jr., the sculptor who inherited all of that material and thus uh, laid it on my shoulders to go forward. Uh, Jean Gibran's father was a union man, a union leader actually, a uh, longshoreman in Lynn, Massachusetts, and at, mm -hmm. on his deathbed, he was reading Ruskin. Wow. Um, yeah, yeah, it's very interesting. 1940s. Man yeah. of the people. Yeah. yeah. Well, the depression and, and, and yeah. socialism mm -hmm. and the idea of, and, and language also has changed. Language has altered. We, we, you were saying really this short attention span is mm -hmm. so dreadful yeah. because folks can't even bear to listen to a sentence more than a certain number of words and can't yeah, listen yeah. to words more than a certain number of syllables. So yeah. we have lost, we're losing, the species is evolving in a very, bizarre way it's dumbing down on all fronts and the republican thing we're going to see on tv tonight which we really i've i've tebowed you know the, the january 6th uh, i hope everybody else has the, the january mm -hmm. 6th introductory uh, the problems that we've been having it's it's just fantastical uh, john ruskin yeah. could have been you know a great leader right now yeah. and and right you now. know to to that point too i just to extend a bit i think what it's what is happening actually to like make a more positive maybe spin on this like lack of attention or whatever is happening is that people are actually understanding that like learning disabilities are a thing. And we're having more conversations about that. And we're having more conversations yeah. about yeah. how yeah. our pedagogy out with the bathwater. Yeah. 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 Like I, I think I think we I didn't like talk about too. yeah and we didn't Absolutely. talk about that before. It's very, very communicative. Yeah. And so now we have different ways of engaging with different things, whether it be a TikTok, you know, and then, and, and, you know, some instructors are actually assigning TikToks for assignments because yeah. they can still meet the same learning outcomes as, you know, a, a pricey for something. Right. So, um, you know, so so it's a, it's an interesting uh, mm -hmm. multimedia world that we live in right now. <laughs> as, as Confucius would say. Yeah. <laughs> Gabriel. Yeah. Well, just I think also one of the things that's striking me is that when Ruskin was working on the education of working men in these working men's colleges after work, um, Ruskin didn't pedagogically present them with a five foot shelf of his works. No. Go read this. Yeah. Ruskin taught them how to draw. Exactly. And Ruskin knew that if not because he wanted to make them artists necessarily, but because he knew that that through beauty and through through art and through seeing was the 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 way into thought yeah. and into engagement and even eventually into critical thinking. That, that famous comment where he makes to business leaders that uh, it's very brave of you. I'm paraphrasing. Very brave of you to have to have hired me to teach your workers how to draw because you do know that if I teach a man how to draw, uh, I teach him how to think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, 
I teach Absolutely. him to think. Yeah, so all of this is connected, but I, th I think the whole notion, uh, we, we've had such a, one of the aspects of the Ruskin revival has been this focus maybe for what, maybe 30, 40 years now, increasing focus on the art. Yeah. You know, that, that really wasn't there in quite this way a half a century ago. And the yeah. recognition that Ruskin really is one of the great artists of the 19th century and a really great artist. So I think it's through his, the, the, um, the products of his own site yeah. that we begin to get the way into the rest of it. Yeah. And he's somehow excited by Turner. Turner is the key that just, yeah. you know, he copies Turner early on. He was, and I'm reading now mm -hmm. the, the, uh, an introduction to, to Ruskin by, by, by Hewison. And his introduction is fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, uh, and he yeah. talks about the sort of prosaic quality of Ruskin's early work in the sense that it, it imita it's imitative of Turner mm -hmm. and not quite as good. And yet you see the Ruskin that will to come in, in the work. You see, mm -hmm. as you see in even early Milton Avery in 1939, you see what's going to come in 1951. Yeah, yeah. yeah. These wonderful pattern. Yeah. Anyway. Well, I think you've given us so much to think about, Anne. But what I, what I love about your talk particularly is that you've given us a lot to think about, but also a lot to act on. Um, mm -hmm. And I can just tell from what people have been saying here that, you know, I think we'll be thinking differently going forward, you know, about how we do present Ruskin and what we can do to reach a different audience and bring other people into that circle, you know, so that he's not being gatekept, as you said, um, yeah. because that's certainly what none of us want. Um, right. But we need to think differently um, about how we go about it. Mm -hmm. So I especially thank you for that, because that's something that we can take away and do something with. And with Ruskin, that's what you want. You want to be doing. You don't want to just right. be thinking. You want to be thinking and doing. So yes. especially appreciate that. Kind of a silver lining to the pandemic are these video recordings, this wonderful uh, yes. resource that, yeah. you know, Gabriel and has been building over these years of uh, video of lectures that yeah. are now there for the ages. They're on YouTube. And exactly. On yeah. The Ruskin right. site. It's just yeah. That's no, it's very, it's very, and, and I mean, as I was saying before, sometimes there's resources that I can't, uh, I can't get here. And so it's nice to have these, this, this YouTube site where we can go and, and watch everyone's lectures. And as you say, sort like for the, for the ages. And so absolutely, yeah. I, Maybe it's, uh, package, package those in a way or present them. Yeah. There was already yeah. media content after yeah. about one hour absolutely. of presentations and so on. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Anne, so very much. Yes, thank you, Anne. Thank you, thank you well, so much. Well, and and thank, you. thank you, thank you, Gabriel, for inviting me as well. It was it was oh, lovely. Delight. Yeah. I'm yeah. Looking forward to this. Um, speaking of which, uh, Anne's uh, talk will be posted shortly on the Ruskin Art Club YouTube channel, www.ruskinartclub.org. So it will be up uh, early next uh, early next week. Uh, a note to uh, the new, the newest newsletter uh, is just out with um, an article by um, a certain Professor Spates on a certain discovery he recently made about Ruskin, about uh, Ruskin marginalia. You have to read the article, so I'm not going to tell you, I'm not going to tell you any more. Um, so uh, that newsletter is out and on the website as well. Um, just a, a couple of uh, just very quick comments. Uh, we will, this is our last event for the spring 2022 uh, season. We're going to take a couple of months off in July and August, but we'll be back with a bang in September with the, uh, the annual Ruskin lecture uh, at USC, at Doheny Library at USC, which um, it looks like, uh, you know, fingers crossed, but looks like uh, it will be an in-person, we're planning for an in-person uh, lecture uh, this year with all the fixings. The, it will have an exhibition of Ruskin Art Club historical materials from the uh, special collections at the Doheny. Um, we will have a reception uh, and of course the lecture. Uh, our lecturer this year will be Professor Eugene McCarraher from uh, Villanova, who's giving us his lecture, the, the topic this year, very provocative, um, The Economy of Heaven, Ruskin, Capitalism, and the Post-Capitalist Future. 
Um, McCarrer has written extensively on this uh, topic. Um, he's the author of The Enchantments of Mammon, How Capitalism Became the Religion of Modernity, which was out in two, 2019, um, and a major um, Ruskin scholar today, particularly in the area, obviously, of economics. I'm just going to read you a very brief abstract of the lecture uh, as a temptation. Uh, while John Ruskin has been recognized as one of the 19th century's most trenchant critics of capitalism, the religious character of his criticism is often ignored, and its contemporary significance is either dismissed or unappreciated. But Ruskin's opposition to capitalism was rooted in a Christian understanding of creation and humanity, a sacramental conception of reality that is urgently relevant as we veer with economic and ecological despoilation looming towards some sort of post-capitalist world. Ruskin's notion of the economy of heaven enables us to envision a world after capitalism that is more humane, generous, and ecologically sensitive than we can achieve by relying on political and technological solutions alone. So we're very much looking forward to welcoming uh, Jean McCarraher uh, in September. The date is September the 8th, 2022. It, it'll be at 5 p.m. at the Doheny Library at uh, USC and we'll be, we'll be um, uh, giving you lots more information about that uh, in the coming weeks. So listen, it has been, this has been a delightful season, so rich, beginning, we, beginning with uh, Proust, uh, and, uh, and ending with uh, popular media. So uh, it's uh, been a very, very rich time. Again, all these lectures are accessible on our YouTube channel uh, and uh, we urge you to pay a visit. Uh, when you pay a visit, be sure to consider subscribing. As we say, it somehow makes YouTube happy. So, uh, uh, <laughs> so, uh, uh, please subscribe if you visit the site. Gabriel, may I may I mention one more thing? Certainly, always. Do. Yeah, um, we are the Ruskin Society of North America is still relatively new in existence, but I wanted to make a make a note to this group that we are going to have our second Ruskin Lifetime Achievement Award given posthumously to the great uh, Ruskin scholar, American Ruskin scholar Van Aken Bird. That will also be in September, and we'll have all the information about that up on the website. And we would hope that everybody uh, who's here tonight and others would attend with us. Uh, Professor Bird was one of the was really one of the great. He's credited and rightly so with reviving modern thought in Ruskin, and when the embers were burning very low indeed. And so he is has not been with us for a few years but he has certainly been one of the great figures in Ruskin scholarship over the last century. So he's going to get our second Ruskin Lifetime Achievement Award in September. And I notify everybody to start thinking about that and we'll put the details up on the Art Club site. Very good. Well, actually the, the announcement is already there. The dates are already there. So good. Uh, so more to come. And that then I think would be a good idea to, to uh, close our our season and uh, inaugurate the summer with more to come. Enjoyed seeing everyone tonight. Yeah, it was good to and, see uh, people. Thank you. Have a great thank summer. You. Sarah, thank you, Gabriel. Certainly, thank right. you. Great. And thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.